Hello, good evening, good afternoon, and good morning to everybody who's uh, joined us today. My name is John Butler. I'm the Aberdeen Maritime Branch Chair uh, for uh, Committee Chair. And uh, I just wanted to welcome you all to tonight's technical presentation. Uh, so for me, it's uh, important that, uh, that we start off the year with a strong uh, presentation and that really fits the themes that we're looking to try and achieve uh, this year. So I'm delighted uh, to have John Grant, who I'll introduce in a moment, to, uh, to present tonight. So from a committee perspective, when we looked at how we wanted to look at the themes for this year, we saw three very important aspects. And the important thing was to ensure that we matched the changing face within the maritime industry. And a lot of the time when we're looking at certain aspects, really we're, uh, it's, it's uh, the nature of the industry and the business is focused on a couple of different areas. And for us, that really looks at decarbonization within the maritime sector, never has there been such a drive for uh, re emissions reductions and, uh, and for lowering of emissions themselves. So it's an important theme that we wanted to make sure we, uh, we approached in the, uh, in the technical presentations this year. Secondly, was the uh, case of renewable energy. Within the maritime sector, there's an abundance of renewable energy now uh, sort of coming out. In locally here in Scotland, you've had Scotwind, which looks at 25 gigawatts of offshore wind and uh, 15 gigawatts being offshore floating wind. So for the maritime sector, this is transformational and really creates a different type of energy ecosystem within the North Sea. So within the Arbody Maritime branch, what we want to make sure was that we were looking to reflect that and uh, reflect the, the interests of the committee members, but also for you, the, the wider group members. And finally, we want to look at sustainability and really identify how uh, through the maritime industry, we can approach a sustainable source of, uh, of energy production, but also uh, offshore energy use and, uh, and, and the use of, the, of, of ocean uh, wealth creation. So from our side, there are the sort of three themes I really want to focus on. So for this year, what you'll see is a lot of the presentations I'll speak to those themes. And uh, so, but for ourselves, what we have here is a, is a presentation uh, that'll be uh, identified by John Grant. Now, uh, there will be a Slido, which you should have, um, uh, a Slido notification that you should have on your invitation. So what I want to make sure is that you're able to use Slido and then write your questions. So myself and my colleagues, Chris, will be in the background. Uh, we'll be looking at your questions. Once John has finished his presentation, then we'll be able to collate questions. And basically what we'll do is we'll have a, we'll have a, effectively like a fireside chat. Now, uh, for by way of introduction, uh, John's on screen now. And uh, so John's the general sales manager uh, for new builds within Mortsilla uh, Marine Power Division in, for the UK and Ireland. Uh, he has worked in this role since 1995, uh, covering all marine and offshore sectors, uh, applications and projects for main propulsion and power generation equipment and related systems. Uh, John is a fellow of both uh, the IMRS and RENA. And uh, John, what I want to do is welcome you to uh, the event. Uh, thank you for your time for the presentation. And if you share your screen, I'll hand it over to yourself. Great, thank you very much, John. Good evening. Um, good day to everyone. Thanks again to the branch for the possibility to come and talk uh, with the local and wider audience tonight. It's very much appreciated. Um, as said, I've uh, been based um, in the UK, working for Vapsilla since 1995, uh, predominantly in the new build sales uh, part of the business, but also latterly involved a, a bit more in the after sales and service support side of the business. Um, for this evening's talk, uh, I'd like to put some viewpoints, some opinions um, out to the audience around the themes, as said, the critical themes of decarbonisation, some related uh, aspects around the future fuels development in that respect. And uh, I would also lead on to a couple of examples uh, emerging from our portfolio, one, one a new build engine and one a retrofit solution, where we start already to implement uh, some of the R&D work, which has been quite frenetically ongoing in the last two years and, and will continue to do so. Um, I should say that the uh, presentation is um, to be seen as 
through the lens of Vatsilla, so our, our way of looking at our uh, markets, our customer segments through the portfolio that we have today to, to that extent. It's a bit of a snapshot, but uh, hopefully it, it, it creates a bit of a stimulus and discussion. Um, one, one element, one single element uh, feeding into the, the greater decarbonisation effort and the optimization of systems is having a very strong and developing engine portfolio. And um, currently within Barcelona, a snapshot looks more or less like this. There is uh, one, one addition, which is um, a 32 methanol engine, which I'll, I'll come on to later on, which has been introduced at the end of last year. But presently, we, we do have a range of liquid fuel, uh, mainly dual fuel uh, gas engines with the DF uh, name. And three years ago, introduced Spark, single Spark and gas engines for Marine as well. That was the last engine introduced, 31 SG. What we will see going forward is this this will remain the core basis of uh, uh, a non-overlapping platform that say, caters for all maritime and offshore sectors in terms of marine power generation and propulsion. But we will see emerging different uh, modifications to these platforms as we verify and test uh, the alternative fuels that are now in discussion today. And that will happen at, at different phased periods, possibly with different technical solutions for different engine bore sizes, because um, it's not a uniform uh, technology platform across all engine types that we start from when we develop an engine. So this is certainly one, one key factor uh, in the step towards decarbonization, having a flexible, uh, adaptable set of uh, power generation solutions from the internal combustion engine part of the portfolio. Similarly, um, both for new build and upgrade, um, there are, we have expanded the, the number of propulsion efficiency devices uh, that we're able to deploy or look to deploy. Again, um, some of these provide partial improvements or percentage or part percentage improvements depending on the ship type, the, the vessel design, the operation profile and, and so on. So there are a number of variables that make some of these solutions more or less um, usable in a given project. But um, latterly, we, we've been involved in quite, quite a few projects uh, for hull air lubrication, which tend to be, you know, uh, rather larger vessels, the likes of LNG carriers, large ferries or cruise ships or large merchant vessels, which seems now to be fairly well proven, uh, not as a concept, but as an actual uh, operating device in terms of improving efficiency. Reducing drag, there are other measures that can be taken, such as uh, modification of software within propulsion control systems to match better the real operating profiles and modes of the vessel. Uh, wind assist, platinum rotors for certain applications, which is of course dependent on the vessel type and uh, the, the trading route of the ship and the environmental conditions uh, wind, wind wise on those routes. Similarly, there are a number of, uh, shall we say, static devices, likes of um, devices which improve the inflow to the propeller, the uh, propeller boss cap, uh, fin devices, uh, these have all been proven to make a difference. Um, there are a number of these things that can be applied, not least of which efficiency rudders, which is a propeller rudder system that is designed as a system. And uh, a new entry last year is a gate rudder, um, top left, which is, uh, again, designed to improve maneuverability and efficiency. So really, there are a number of those devices available. Some are new, and many can be applied to both new build and retrofit. And they have to be seen as one element that feeds into improving the efficiency of the whole package in operation and during the life cycle, and rather not as standalone uh, products. Also to be considered, uh, feeding into the effort for decarb is electrification increasingly and really optimizing the system and the offering uh, around the operating profile of the, the vessel, which is really quite critical. Um, if you look maybe perhaps at how the system is changing or how the approach is changing, in previous years, we might have seen the internal combustion engine as being at the heart of a solution we would have offered, uh, then perhaps with some other elements of propulsion, um, you know, uh, electric power distribution and other equipment. Uh, what we're certainly seeing today is that decarbonisation seems to be driving uh, complexity and let's say the variability within systems such that it's really no longer safe to assume that the internal combustion engine is going to be the main source of power generation in future. It's certainly going to be present uh, in one form or another, but uh, it could well be uh, let's say supplemented through other means. 
batteries, fuel cells, photovoltaics, uh, wind assist energy, uh, specialised propulsion devices, and, and so on. So the, the change really is that the heart of the system uh, is no longer the hardware or, or the engine as such, but uh, the power management and energy management system, which is really controlling uh, the operability of these elements at the right time in the right way to make sure the whole system operates correctly. And that's a fairly significant change from a few years back and probably a change that's going to be required if you're future-proofing vessels today to make them more expandable, flexible and resilient as, as propulsion solutions tomorrow. Looking at um, our electrification offerings, um, large shaft generators, uh, take for example deep sea vessels such as LNG carriers, um, in the last couple of years, large merchant ships as well, we've seen an increase in the number of large shaft generators deployed uh, and also a reduction in the auxiliary gen sets thereof. So it's in a small way, that's a contributor towards some element of decarb. These electric systems in general seem to be now on the increase quite consistently over the last years um, for all kinds of applications, <clears throat> not just large vessels like cruise ferry, but also you know, OSV, turbine installation vessels, all kinds of coastal applications, research vessels. It, it's a trend we don't see declining, uh, and, and certainly that is driven partially by the decarbonisation effort. Hybrid systems similarly as part of a diesel electric system. Um, this is not particularly new, but um, again, the increasing uh, frequency we, we see uh, vessels requiring this kind of design is quite notable. And, um, you know, maybe this has been more, more uh, used on coastal tugs, ferries, BP type applications in the past, but certainly the storage can serve as a spinning reserve within the electric system, take out an auxiliary engine perhaps, as well as optimizing the operation of engines, uh, which do remain in terms of taking the peak shaving or, or, or acting as the load boost uh, when there are load peaks in the system. And perhaps in the future, a little bit more, we'll see all electric uh, solutions, small coastal vessels, ferries and tugs, where we may see engines almost displaced, I would imagine, if they're small output engines with fuel cells or, or other sources, batteries or, or wind and solar sources. That is, that's quite foreseeable. And perhaps an, an, odd, an odd one to consider, but in the last years, shore connection, standardized shore connection has been more discussed around large container ships at container ship ports or large merchant ships or, or, or crews. But now uh, we do see, and even in smaller coastal projects and ferry projects, domestically, there are suddenly comes up discussions about shore connection systems and requirements, and that's not an easy thing to standardize when there are a number of customers um, with different requirements. But again, it seems to, seems to show that electrification is, is on the rise. So uh, with the way we would view this, um, that ourselves or any other kind of a partner or supplier to ship owners, we would really need uh, to have a range of uh, equipment for, for a start, propulsion equipment, engines, abatement, energy and power management systems, hybrid systems, including batteries and or fuel cells in the future. And of course, uh, the fuel gas storage and supply system that would be relevant. That, that's all fine, uh, especially for the, the new build view of the, of the subject. But of course, a lot of these uh, offerings will be available as upgrades and retrofits. So to complement uh, those offerings, we do need, and other organisations would also need to have a range of agreements and support agreements to make sure the plan operates optimally as, as it's been designed to do. Um, and in, in our case, we have also uh, expanded a project services organisation to be able to handle complex project upgrades, which are not, not dissimilar to uh, new builds and complexity in some cases. Um, as I said before, I mean, the, the number of individual elements that are available to, uh, to us within our portfolio and others within broad portfolios is, is one thing, and each of those has to, has to offer something as a discrete unit. But of course, uh, more importantly than that, uh, the integration of all of those discrete units and products and subsystems has to be thought about carefully uh, up front and done in such a way and manage in such a way operationally that the whole system works uh, in an optimal manner and not just uh, one or two products within the system. And that is really quite a significant uh, change in the way we have to plan uh, the offerings that we're making for given projects. 
just as an example of how we go about approaching this in a, in a new build, uh, also to let's say meet our decarbonisation targets. Um, top left, we would now spend quite a lot of time, much more than before, in uh, really understanding the operating profile and the vessel requirements. So, so, you know, having access to GAs, vessel specifications, operation profiles, load profiles, um, you know, listings of maximum peak loads, etc. Feed that in um, to the design process, which produces uh, one or two or three um, single line diagrams with certain machinery arrangements, which all potentially could meet the owner's operational requirements. Um, having an iterative discussion around that and uh, a step which is perhaps not new to many in the industry, but it's certainly new to, to companies uh, like Virtula in the last four or five years is to develop a detailed functional specification uh, a little bit later on in the project, which complements the detailed um, single line diagram and technical specification. And that, that again is quite a, a, a change in order to make sure that every, every participant knows how the system should operate and how it would operate under certain conditions. Uh, and that includes, you know, um, the emission performance and the fuel consumption performance and a host of other variables as determined by the project. So I'll now move on a little bit to the, the, the topic of future fuels and decarb in general. Um, as we all are, are all too strongly aware, there is a huge challenge facing ship owners and ship operators and the industry in general, and it's uh, a fairly stark challenge. Uh, and perhaps in light of the, the, the events of the last couple of weeks of this, this will be accelerated further or focused on even more strongly than before. But, uh, you know, uh, the industry does need to make these advances rather rapidly uh, towards 2030 and thereafter to 2050 um, in order to come up with uh, flexible, realizable solutions which actually deliver the value in terms of emission reduction without compromising uh, any other element of performance that that an owner would require. Uh, the way we've uh, viewed this uh, sort of challenge is from two perspectives, from the uh, vessel perspective and also uh, you know, from the fuel perspective. So from a vessel perspective, as, as I mentioned before, we look to see how the voyage could be optimized. We look at the energy need, how that should be distributed. We look at the power distribution system and we come up with suggestions for energy efficient power generation architecture. Um, immediately an owner might say then, as, at least as an interim step, can I switch to gas? Uh, yes or no? If yes, there are options out there, conventional LNG, bio LNG, um, and uh, let's say synthetic LNG. If no, there are the liquid fuel options available today, which is HFOMGO, liquid biofuels or synthetic liquid fuels. And the, the benefit of being able to adopt some of those as an intermediate step is that the, the infrastructure is there, the safety and experience and regs are there. It could be quite a fast market take up. Although fuels like, like methanol, which are now emerging, uh, the potential adoption growth rate might actually accelerate fairly quickly due to the, the ease of uh, relative ease of storage of the fuel, but we'll come on to that later. Um, notes that we would uh, like to highlight in relation to this, we think that this sort of pathway could be a, a stepping stone for most of the bulk of uh, the global shipping industry in general. Of course, there will be localized solutions that are more viable, more logical, more profitable. Um, as we mentioned, electrification seems to happen a lot now in the segments where it is actually possible to introduce it, particularly inland waterways, short distance ferries, coastal operations uh, for, for pure uh, electric vessels. And uh, we do expect that other, other sectors, you know, uh, road sector and other industrial sectors will drive down and accelerate the, the development of batteries, but drive down the battery cost and the fuel cell cost over time, which would allow those to be adopted in the marine sector as well. Uh, Certainly up until now, the, the battery hybrid uh, element of the package is somewhat limited due to the size, weight, cost and uh, let's say operational efficacy of the batteries. That again may change depending on how the battery technology develops in the future. Um, hydrogen and ammonia are still relatively specialist at the moment, although the, the interest and the activity has accelerated quite markedly, especially around ammonia in, in the last 12 to 18 months, still dependent on uh, development of rules, regulations and experience, 
and uh, of course the customer requirements and their end customer requirements. Um, other synthetic fuels, um, hydrogen carriers are able to be built from green hydrogen and uh, can be used also as a practical uh, fuel. So if we look at the array of fuels that, that are, are out there today that we need to consider on our palette when we develop engines for the future, we have the existing fossil fuels, HFO, MGO, LNG and LPG. Uh, and to meet the legislation to date, we've deployed additional technologies such as scrubbers and SCRs. In future, that could also include carbon capture systems. Uh, and it's worth noting, um, we have a sister division in Wurzela, which is the scrubber division, which is now, uh, as of January this year, started an R&D project in Norway to, to uh, test and verify how, how feasible it is to develop a, a marine carbon capture system. And that's something that will we'll glean some results, initial results during this year and next year and into a, a pilot installation. It's by, by no means a straightforward process um, and it is an additional process on the ship, but certainly it, it's a factor to consider. Um, looking at the biofuels um, array, uh, you've got, well, your, your normal biofuels, the hydro-treated uh, vegetable oils, um, you've got also the uh, let's say, uh, more, more exotic sort of crude biofuels, the soya, rapeseed, palm oils, the uh, biomethane, compressed biogas, um, which is a high, sort of high, high methane content fuel, um, liquid biomethane and bioethanol. Those are all available. And if you look then at the newer array, the power to X, the e-fuels, which are essentially energy transformation related fuels uh, using electricity, uh, from a from a let's see renewable source uh, to develop these fuels we have uh, hydrogen ammonia methanol and methane and that's really this is a span that certainly Wurzel has been concentrating on in the last couple of years how do we see certainty in transition well uh, to be honest it's, it's not a very certain picture but the way we see to manage it is uh, by starting off with a multi-fuel uh, engine platform technology which offers a certain degree of flexibility and we see between today and let's say heading up to 2030 uh, the adoption of lower carbon fuel solutions either as drop-in fuels or as a blended solution and that is certainly something that Silla has been testing as as a step uh, heading towards the uh, 2050 mark where real net zero carbon fueling is the target that, that we need to achieve taking account of reduction and the, let's say the fleet growth size that requires that reduction by that time. Uh, looking at the same graph in a slightly different way, yes, we've got the regulations. Um, yes, we've got the fuels, either the, the fossil fuels with abatement, the drop-in blending or the green fuels, but more and more uh, pressing and more and more um, in the discussion today are other stakeholders such as banks, the cargo owners, and indeed public opinion. So, you know, there are various bodies set up around green financing, uh, for example, Poseidon Principles. There's also a sea cargo charter around green, green cargo charter requirements. And the cargo owners own targets, uh, own public perception, and in fact, the mounting public pressure generally uh, within countries, regions, and towards certain owners all plays a part as to which of those fuels would be uh, acceptable, uh, depending on the, the pros and cons of the fuel type. So that, again, complicates the, the discussion to an extent in the sense that there's a greater number of more influential stakeholders and perhaps have been uh, visible uh, within these project developments than, than previous times. So looking at uh, both the new build and existing fleet, I mean, ship owners are now in a very tricky situation generally where they have to plan a future fleet growth against somewhat moving targets and really uh, trusted partners who are capable of building in flexibility and offering upgrades in the future are probably what those those owners are looking for and that's certainly what, what we try to position ourselves as being uh, on the new build side the the, the clear uh, target would be to invest in some form of upgradable asset and find partners who are able to deliver those upgrades through the whole life of the ship and uh, it's possible to build alternative fuel ready assets, perhaps heading towards 2030, but certainly the target after that would be to design and build uh, zero carbon ships from, from most owners would imagine. Existing fleet wise, uh, when we're facing uh, EEXI and then uh, the, the increasing demands from the CII uh, regime, uh, 
Um, again, installation of energy saving devices or power limiters or other means by which to initially meet the EEXI, EEDI requirements and to also meet ongoing CII requirements. That, that would be something that, that certainly we would continue to develop as would others. Uh, or really the stark alternative is convert to an alternative fuel when an upgrade's available, or uh, in the worst case, sell or scrap the asset, which is quite a stark situation. Um, certainly the transition to green fuels is happening and it's going to be somewhat slow, but it's, it's an unstoppable train, it's relentless, it's in the public eye, it's in the political eye, and it's, it's certainly required for the, uh, for the environment. Um, so by 2050, from now, you're looking at a single vessel lifespan away, and therefore customers do need to have partners and technology that provides fuel flexibility uh, in order just to avoid the risk of potentially stranded assets. And they need to therefore select over uh, equipment over the course of the vessel lifetime, which is going to allow multi-fuel uh, application with blending of green fuels and conversion possibilities for the future. So wherever those solutions come from, those would appear to be the genetic requirements. So when looking, uh, you know, at this in the round, I mean, certainly bio and hydrogen based fuels are going to be essential post 2030 in, in meeting these targets. That seems to be fairly clear. There are a number of factors we should also uh, consider, such as the availability of uh, fuel, the particular fuel chosen, um, availability, cost, logistics around the supply of the fuel, et cetera, all feed into the viability of a project. Um, the, the overall increase in capex and opex for a given solution for a given fuel type, uh, the overall impact on the vessel structure, because um, as we'll see, different fuels have different requirements in terms of volumetric efficiency. Uh, that has to be borne in mind. And uh, going along with all of that is the increased complexity, not, not only of the technical and design solution on the ship, but in, in the engagement of the stakeholders, the provision of the finance, uh, and so on to make the projects happen and the acceptability to the, uh, the public uh, where those vessels would be operating or serving. And uh, finally, for uh, upgrade or new build, we're also considering uh, shipyard capacity, uh, yards ability to meet those demands. So um, briefly, uh, there are choices that can be made today that will help already get underway. Um, looking at fossil LNG, bio LNG, or synthetic LNG, yes, that's that's available, and you can get between a five and twenty percent impact well to wake wise. There is, of course, a high focus on methane slip. Great reductions have taken place, and that that work is ongoing to reduce further. And um, today, there are the fossil uh, liquid fuels, bio liquid fuels, synthetic fuels, which again, if they're bio and synthetic, can offer a significant uh, well to wake GHG reduction. Looking forward, uh, green hydrogen, uh, it's a zero carbon fuel with no CO2 emission. It can be blended with uh, CNG and LNG up to 25% by volume. There are challenges with storing uh, hydrogen at the temperature minus 253, amongst other things. Um, green ammonia, again, a zero carbon fuel, no CO2 emission, can be blended both with liquid and gaseous fuels. It is highly toxic. And of course, there are some safety requirements, regulations and concepts that are under development that will be absolutely ne necessary. Then uh, green methanol and ethanol, it's carbon neutral, can be blended with other liquid fuels. Um, the technology is developed and uh, we have one product now released, a new product, the 32M, which we'll talk about a wee bit later. It's toxic and uh, regulations do exist. So biofuels and summary are to some extent available today. Green biomethane, most likely the most economical alternative because of the maturity of this technology, the availability, uh, existing rules and regs, availability of feedstock, um, and a higher carbon efficiency than biodiesel. Could be a drop in fuel also to natural gas, which makes it potentially attractive. Synthetic methane uh, differs a little bit in its production process. So green synthetic methane is produced from green hydrogen and CO2. Uh, and due to the low CO2 concentration in there, it's only really economically viable to produce from combustion biofuels. Then um, first and second generation biodiesels um, can be used without much limitation on the engines themselves, but uh, the factors possibly there are price availability locally and competing with other industries. And of course, 
something to be borne in mind, which we'll cover a wee bit later. The volumetric efficiency or the vessel range, depending on the fuel type, differs quite significantly for a given power demand based on the, the lower heating value of the fuels. You can see on the table on the right, it's quite a stark difference, uh, ranging from diesel to methane to methanol, ammonia and hydrogen. And that, of course, is something that has to be looked at in great detail on a project-specific basis. Looking at the lower heating value, just as another way to show that kind of stark difference. Um, vertically, we have lower heating value megajoules per cubic meter versus horizontally lower heating value megajoules per kilogram. And you can see HFO and MDO up here on the top right hand corner uh, with rather high values compared to methanol and ammonia. So you can see the challenge being the volume uh, of these lower heating value fuels in comparison with traditional fuels. Uh, in order to get the same output or have the same uh, energy production. And the number of fuels in our view will increase. So green hydrogen, yeah, it's an essential element in most synthetic fuels, um, short sea shipping, we've got strict leg legislation emission wise, and there could be frequent bunkering opportunities that might offset the use of that fuel and its low energy density. So um, green ammonia, at low energy density by volume, um, it is feasible. Uh, for vessels that don't have a space limitation. The, the toxicity appears to be a major challenge, especially for passenger and other vessels. The regulation is under development and may have an impact on the required investment cost and investment, uh, let's say, taste for investment. Green methanol, it's an interesting alternative because of relatively easy onboard storage. Uh, although fuel prices may be higher due to the energy production costs, uh, it has a relatively low energy density, but that's somewhat compensated by its ease of storage. So this does vary a lot region by region, of course, and uh, all, all of this uh, green uh, definition assumes the fuels are based on uh, using renewable energy from a, a fuel produced from sustainable uh, biomass. So um, in, in summary there, we do, don't think uh, from the view today that green synthetic fuels will be widely available before 2040. Um, converting uh, all the ships that need conversion will take many years and that, that does place a challenge on yard capacity as well as uh, financial and commercial uh, technical feasibility for the solutions that are, are being produced. Um, owners could make a, a step in the right direction with LNG as an intermediate step with a, something between a 5 to 21 reduction percentage wise. And yeah, that could be a first step towards decarbonisation, although it's by no means uh, reaching the target we all have to, to reach at this stage. So what is uh, what's the engaged in? Um, typically, as a company now, we've very clearly stated we're fuel agnostic. So in that sense, we're not trying to second guess the fuel supply market or, or the demand in that supply market, but we're looking at the requests from customers. And uh, we're also therefore uh, looking at what the requirements are uh, for development of our portfolio. Bio LNG is well known to us for over 20 years, um, or synthetic methane, so that can be readily used. Engine development as such is, is more refinement. Um, and uh, the cryogenic LNG operations are also well known with the IGF code uh, being in, in force since 2016. That being said, we do continue to develop the, uh, the dual fuel LNG engines. Then uh, green methanol. Um, we, we have a first vessel in operation 2015, Stenner Germanica, with a converted ZA40S engine. Uh, that's been running uh, pretty well since then. And in fact, the feedback from that installation, together with other development work, has produced a 32M methanol engine, which we'll talk about a wee bit later. Um, Non-pressurised tanks are required, and it's a toxic fuel with, again, some local emission uh, abatement requirement around NOx in particular. Um, green ammonia, um, this is perhaps a bit more challenging. We, we are very active in testing ammonia and in the last year we've achieved a 70% ammonia blend on a liquid fueled engine in the lab. Um, during this year, the plan is for gaseous ammonia testing. That is still work ongoing between now and 2023 uh, for the concept and possibly later than that, 2024 uh, onwards for uh, Let's say an engine technology that could be considered to be implemented in a real production engine. And uh, maybe with a slightly longer timeline, uh, we have uh, hydrogen testing and engines. 
we're already able to blend hydrogen up to 25% with LNG. And during last year, there was a, a let's say, testing with a spark ignited gas engine where pure hydrogen operation at part loads was already achieved. So that's actually quite a strong step towards the target of having the technical concept ready by 2025. With hydrogen, the uh, main challenge is uh, storage at minus 253. Um, but we'll, we'll come on to that in a wee while. But uh, as I said, Wurzel is fuel agnostic as a company, so whatever fuels need to be catered for in the market, we will have to develop solutions that, that cater for those, technically. Um, generally, the way we've been working and where we are today, um, the ideas have come up and we've uh, we focused on a few different fuels based on feedback from the market, the customer and other, other research. The proof of concept is ongoing now between 2021 and all the way up to 2025. So the methanol uh, is one industrialised product uh, that's come out of proof of concept with the 32M just launched end of last year. The ammonia concept should be ready 2023 and the hydrogen concept 2025, which means they've gone through an R&D um, test regime um, defining the performance, addressing the, the safety critical aspects, and so on. And it's only really when uh, we've got a, a proof of concept ready and validated and some pilot installation work uh, ongoing in some seeded installations, then we can have uh, an industrialized uh, solution. But, um, you know, it's a very dynamic marketplace. It's a very dynamic set of requirements, so things are, are moving quickly. Um, you, you would assume that uh, the solutions need to be in the market when the fuels are actually available to be used, when the infrastructure is there, and also when the rules and regulations exist. But as I said, those, those aspects all are moving relatively quickly. So when introducing a new fuel to an engine, what typically would you need to consider? Um, for the fuel gas supply system, uh, the, the tank and the supply system, the materials, the pressurization range, insulation, and the toxicity of the fuel have to be taken into account. For the engine, it's the top part of the engine where most of the modification is on the combustion related part of the engine. Fuel injection systems, cylinder heads and piston crowns typically. Um, more, more importantly as well, uh, depending on the fuel, specialised exhaust gas abatement or after treatment, which could include modified SCRs or scrubbers or carbon capture. And uh, safety systems, of course, uh, not just uh, safety systems in, in, in terms of the normal product system, but uh, also meeting fully the regulatory body safety requirements, whatever those may be, um, according to you know class approvals and so on. But I think one thing that you can say is that the uh, engine platform in itself is not the limiting factor. Um, certainly, there's a lot of uh, specific adaption uh, to be done on the combustion related side of the engines, but, but really the engine is already capable of an, a range of fuel handling, uh, and that's not, that's not seen as being what will stop or hold up projects going, going ahead generally, they will be developed. It does take a certain amount of time to safely develop products that perform correctly, and it's actually not possible to develop every engine range at the same pace for every fuel type at the same time. So there is an element of uh, market demand and project demand and customer demand, which feeds into that. But it would appear that the fuel availability, the storage, the safety regulations, et cetera, determine a little bit more which solutions are going to be environmentally desirable and uh, economically sustainable. So we are aiming to try and meet that demand. Just a snapshot and overview, and this, this will change over time, but if you take all of that as a whole, um, a system supplier like, like ourselves would be looking to have a range of solutions for a range of fuel types, some of which are still in technical concept development, um, a hybrid and full electric system offering and power distribution capability, um, eventually bringing in fuel cells to the, to the equation and within the system as those become more technically viable and commercially viable and add into the range of energy saving devices and perhaps additional energy production devices, again, to bring into what will be a, an energy managed integrated system rather than uh, an engine with some components uh, attached to it. So, so no doubt this, this table will expand in the coming years and that, that is really the direction that we have to follow. Um, as, a, as a side note, a um, company like Wurzel would always wish to supply the, the fuel system regardless of the fuel uh, that's being used. 
So there is work ongoing and work that has been done to advance that. Um, looking at uh, what could be done on existing dual fuel engines, as an example, on existing diesel engines, um, going back to already last year, there are there are improvements that can be made by upgrade on existing engines, both diesel and multi-fuel engines in order to already uh, improve and, and minimise even further the methane slip and, um, and other emission. And the first of those um, we saw last year where for the uh, What's the 20 DF and 34 DF engines? We did an, introduce a GHG uh, retrofit pack, which reduced the, um, the methane slip also at part loads for, for both of those engines as an intermediate step. Um, this does not um, doesn't impact the ongoing development that, that we have for the new engine types to reduce methane slip even further in its own right. That's an additional retrofit measure. And uh, the way we've Kind of looked at this generally is if, if staying with only a staying with only a couple of uh, technologies looking at diesel engine alone um, we could develop a diesel engine to cater for biodiesel ammonia and methanol and uh, whereas a multi-fuel dual fuel engine we have a, a broader range of possibilities there fuel wise so we could be looking at the, the same as a pure diesel engine or we could also be looking at for the auto cycle the gas the gas cycle for that engine, bio LNG, synthetic LNG, or ammonia. So in that sense, a dual, engine, a dual fuel engine platform might offer a, a high degree of flexibility for future upgrade and retrofit when we have those solutions developed. Um, looking at technologies we have engine-wise in the table here down the left-hand column, um, these are the technology platforms that we have generally, the first four of which are, are marine deployed and the last one isn't so far. We have a pure diesel engine, um, dual fuel engine, diesel LNG, spark ignited gas engine, which is pure gas, um, gas diesel engine, which is no longer sold but was some years ago, which is a high pressure gas injection engine. And finally, an LG engine, which is a land-based power plant technology, which is a liquid gas engine, it's called, which is another technology for a high-pressure pilot injection engine. And um, the point really on the table is that we have a number of fuels that we're trying to develop for. Um, and you can see that several of the platforms offer us opportunities to, to develop and, uh, let's see, come up with new solutions for those engines uh, those engine platforms for those fuels. So this this is what we begin to see. So for example, with the um, W32 methanol engine has actually taken a good deal of its heritage from the gas diesel technology in that particular case. And that is because we've had an engine of that bore size with that technology to develop from. What we may see um, in future is that different bore sizes of engine, which have different historical timelines, will have different technological solutions potentially, even for the same fuel. It's something which is uh, very fluid at the moment and uh, in verification through the, the R&D process. Similarly for the fuel storage, um, we have LNG pack for uh, LNG, of course, and I've got quite some broad experience with that. It is possible to develop variants of that for other fuels such as ammonia and methanol and possibly hydrogen as well. Um, that's fairly early on in its infancy because we're not really engaged in so many uh, mature projects where those uh, fuels are, are being considered yet because the engine technology is still under development. But certainly it's our intention and it would be required to be able to supply the fuel system as well as, as the uh, future fuel capable engines. So in summary there, um, certainly one one advantage of starting from a multi-fuel engine is that you have both diesel and auto combustion cycles and liquid and gas operation, which means uh, there should be a good deal of flexibility for future retrofit potentially. Um, something to, to make you aware of, um, we have an ongoing dual fuel uh, development on the 31DF, which is um, one of the most modern uh, platforms in, in the portfolio. Uh, some lab testing has already been carried out to improve the, the overall engine performance and reduce the methane slip even more significantly than, than prior. Uh, that will now go on to field test 2022-2023 and could be available for production 2024. So that being successful, that may well uh, help to extend the window of opportunity where uh, dual fuel, LNG fuel 
solutions might still be viable and attractive if, uh, for example, the methane slip level is uh, drastically reduced. So we don't uh, stop development uh, for those dual fuel engines, we carry on in parallel with the development uh, for the other engines. So I'll now quickly jump on to uh, alternative fuel handling view uh, as from the view of a, a fuel gas supply system uh, supplier perspective, as we also are, what, the, what are the challenges with such fuels? So hydrogen, natural gas, ammonia, and methanol have natural states and ambient. The first three are gases, uh, methanol is a liquid. Um, they have different storage temperature requirements ranging from minus 253 to ambient. And um, yeah, hydrogen being very close to absolute zero presents quite some significant uh, challenges in terms of uh, materials, technology, and uh, the overall system. Uh, natural gas minus 162, ammonia minus 33, and methanol ambient. Um, flammability limits need to be considered um, when looking at these fuels. So a red light for hydrogen, which is a very uh, broad window uh, for flammability and requires very little energy to uh, ignite it. Um, same methanol uh, and ammonia have a similar, uh, sort of smaller window, shall we say, um, although the amount of energy required for methanol ignition is, is fairly small compared to ammonia. Um, and LNG has a very narrow window, but again, requires not too much energy to ignite it. Toxicity and health. There is a risk, of course, of explosion in the confined space from, from any of these fuels. Um, hydrogen being close to absolute zero, it's an extremely flammable fuel. It obviously carries some risk. LNG is cryogenic, which means there are you know, certain obvious safety requirements there, which are now quite well defined. Methanol is relatively low toxicity, but flammable. And ammonia is highly toxic and corrosive. So clearly they all present challenges to the, uh, the operator. Looking at methanol uh, as a fuel, main hazards for methanol would be toxic, flammable, and it has an invisible flame. Um, it's the simplest fuel to bunker as it's liquid and ambient conditions. Um, it's a toxic fuel, but you can still touch it without too much damage. And you really need high concentrations to cause serious harm to people. So it's perhaps unlikely to represent a risk of death. Um, very soluble in water. Um, and the leakage in the sea would dissolve rather quickly and become non-flammable. Um, looking at bunker stations, those should be located on the open deck or have forced ventilation um, and considered hazardous zone one. So an airlock might be needed between the bunker station and the non-hazardous area. Entrances and air inlets, openings to accommodation, service machinery spaces and control stations should not face that bunkering station. These are all considerations for the fuel gas supply system. Ammonia, um, challenging, highly toxic, explosive, corrosive, and flammable, uh, but can be transferred at liquid conditions close to ambient, making it a relatively easy fuel to bunker. Um, it's not stored cryogenically, but is highly toxic and corrosive, um, can be detected in rather small concentrations by smell. However, any leakage at all has to be contained. The main risk um, would appear to be a possible dispersion in air of a possible leakage. And so the focus area in that case of a major leakage, it could be five to 10 times larger in radius compared to other fuels due to this toxicity. That's a serious problem. The, the best way to transfer it is at minus 33 in ambient. Um, can be transferred by pressurizing at 18 bar, maybe for smaller volumes. But then the focus of the design would be risk areas around potential leakage, uh, as those are then uh, greater compared to transfer at atmospheric pressure. Similar bunker station requirements as for LNG, preference would be uh, semi enclosed bunker stations or on deck. Methane. Flammable, explosive, cryogenic, and asphyxiating. Uh, one of the biggest challenges is the storage temperature because it's compressed. It's not a space efficient solution. Second aspect is that being a gas, all the leakages has to be contained and ventilated from the vessel. Uh, the bunker and operations require preparation of lines with cool down and inerting. And inerting operations can be carried out with nitrogen. Bunker pipes are normally vacuum insulated to prevent the risk uh, contact with cold surfaces and heat ingress to contain leakage. 
and the bunker stations should have drip should be sorry, uh, should have drip trays uh, under certain conditions and should be either on the deck or have forced ventilation. Hydrogen, finally, th flammable, very flammable and explosive. Uh, one of the biggest challenges is the space that it takes and uh, see, storing it in liquid form is probably uh, the most efficient way to do that, but requires extremely low temperature, close to absolute zero. And it's extremely flammable, so therefore leakages have to be diluted and kept outside that flammability range. Um, the flows will be larger, relatively speaking, compared to other fuels due to the, the transfer of the same energy content. Um, bunkering operations would imply challenges for the pre uh, and after bunkering procedure. So in terms of cool down and inerting, nitrogen wouldn't be suitable. Um, helium uh, would be, but is a rather expensive medium. Uh, again, the piping should be vacuum insulated to contain the leakages, avoid contact risks, uh, heat ingress, and the liquefaction of uh, liquefaction of uh, oxygen around those pipes. So liquefied oxygen can uh, explode under those conditions with organic material. Uh, and generally, for the enclosed space, um, you know the concentration has to be dealt with uh, appropriately to prevent the formation uh, of uh, say five to ten percent in that room. Energy-wise, as we showed earlier, it's another view of the same sort of challenge. The volumetric, uh, uh, let's say, requirements of certain fuels for the same energy content uh, needs to be looked at very carefully in terms of the vessel autonomy uh, when designing a fuel system and um, also the operating profile, uh, the real operating profile, that is, uh, and, and uh, other logistical uh, aspects that the owner or operator might face. Um, future fuels conversion modification impact, as I said before, just a, a quick reminder for the fuel gas system, as we've seen from the, the different gases before, we need to look at materials, pressurization, the insulation requirement, the toxicity. For the engine, it's the top part, cylinder heads, piston crowns. Then we have the after treatment, SCR scrubbers or carbon capture, and all the safety related uh, systems, design impacts, uh, safety systems, etc. Um, and just, just again, last year, uh, we tested six, let's say, significantly in the lab and achieved a 70% blend of ammonia in liquid form with liquid fuel in a diesel engine. And on a spark ignited gas engine, pure hydrogen, 100% hydrogen was achieved at 50% load in the lab. So that, that was actually quite a, quite a positive development quite quickly. And those tests will continue this year with, um, first of all, uh, heading into gaseous ammonia testing and at different pressures for ammonia and um, with hydrogen in greater proportion uh, within the spark ignited gas engine. And, and of course, the work continues on the, the dual fuel engines in parallel. So um, now for one example of a new product that's uh, just been released at the end of last year. So the first to emerge from all of this R&D work that's ongoing, that's a Vatsala 32 uh, methanol engine, which is available now uh, for new build and retrofit. So as we've seen, methanol, um, it's a biodegradable alcohol with a low carbon content, the lowest carbon content and highest hydrogen content of liquid fuel. Relatively easy to store on board, uh, covered by the IGF code. Uh, and quite significantly, when, when it's made using renewable resources like biomass, um, and if it's used, uh, if that is used to produce it from renewable energies, it then is considered a green neutral methanol, carbon neutral methanol. So feeding that into the overall view of it, um, you could then compare with uh, green methanol, you could say the CO2 reduction you can achieve from a methanol engine is minus 80%, uh, NOx minus 50, filter smoke minus 50. So yes, I mean, it does rely heavily on having green methanol available and produced in the right manner, but it does seem to offer a, a, a readily achievable step towards uh, decarbonisation as a whole. There are methanol terminals currently in operation around the world producing a significant amount of methanol, 98 million metric tons every year. So the upscaling of that would appear to be something that is uh, achievable. Um, the 32 methanol engine is available for delivery March as of next year. It's an engine based on the 32 engine. Uh, also design-wise, uh, the experience from the 32 gas diesel, high gas pressure injection engine, and the Sultzer's Eddy 40 methanol 
engine that has both fed into the development of this particular engine. It's, it's somewhat like a dual fuel engine in that there's a backup fuel operation possible, uh, either LFO or, or, or liquid biofuel or heavy fuel. Um, when it's operating in methanol mode, uh, it's methanol plus a pilot uh, liquid fuel. So it's a kind of fuel modulation. And if the methanol uh, supply dries up, then you automatically switch back to the, the pilot fuel. So it's not the, not the sort of occasion that you would have uh, any interruption in the power supply. Um, it's released as auxiliary and diesel electric engine at the moment, and also variable speed main engine with a slightly del uh, later delivery date of October next year. The first order for this engine was for the Dutch company um, Van Ord at Yantai Raffles just before Christmas, who have invested in a wind turbine installation vessel, which will be powered by five such engines running on methanol. Uh, so that's an order entered into the order book, uh, quarter one this year for delivery early next year. Um, and as we see, that delivery forms part of the process of the type approval and EIAPP of, of the product in itself. Um, but the, uh, the actual injector and equipment development started quite some time ago, back in June uh, 2021. So it's been a relatively quick ramp up and release for this product. And that's partially because we're very familiar with the original technology platform. We have a lot of feedback from the Stena Germanica on the methanol uh, operation, and it's, it's it's a fairly known entity for us. So it's not as complicated in the R&D as some of the other variants we're now trying to develop. The engine itself has the same output as, as a liquid fueled engine. The main difference is in the fuel injection system, um, which does have a, a jerk pump diesel mode uh, configuration as, as with the, the, the normal 32 for diesel operation, but it does uh, for methanol rely on a common rail methanol uh, system, which is electronically uh, controlled. Uh, at the moment, we've released six, seven, eight and nine inline engines, but it is also planned to release the 12 and 16 V engine as well, according to market demand. Looking at the, uh, the arrangement of the system and the fuel supply system, um, the main components on the engine that are different, we have a multi-fuel injection system, which uh, comprises a common injector unit whereby methanol, pilot and backup are all channeled through a common injector. Um, cylinder heads are optimized therefore for methanol combustion as a fuel and also for the pilot and main fuel combustion. And we have a common rail system for the methanol fuel in itself. We would also be looking to supply the key elements of the methanol fuel supply system. There are optional units. Uh, optionally, there's a low pressure pump with a cooler, number one, uh, a fuel valve train, number two. What, what we would always supply would be number three, methanol fuel pump unit, and number four, a control oil sealing unit as well. Uh, nitrogen generators required, that, that can be optionally supplied by ourselves. The methanol fuel pump unit, it's um, delivering up to 600 bar, which is the pressure of a uh, injection. It's a VFD driven system um, inclusive of cooler and leakage detection. It's a fairly compact unit, one per engine. And similarly, one per engine, there's a control and uh, sealing oil unit which utilizes clean engine oil, uh, provides a sealing uh, oil at 700 bar and the control oil at 400 bar. And that's also one, one per engine. And quite Critically, we, we have got an optimized SCR, which is designed to run in both methanol and diesel mode um, independently. So that is designed to be able to cater for the differences in the fuels and still meet all the other requirements you, you may expect uh, for, for NOx reduction operation, including uh, the certification to tier three compliance. So it's a fairly, uh, fairly ready system to go in, in projects and to make a, a, a move towards methanol today. As said, uh, some of the feedback was gleaned from uh, Stena Germanica conversion back in 2015. Um, and that was uh, an engine conversion scope with auxiliary equipment uh, during a six week period for a diesel electric ship uh, that, was, that was carried out for Stena. And that has been a fairly successful uh, project for us. If, if of interest, I'll flag it up here. There is actually a couple of uh, webinars coming up, which you can find in the works of the dot com website around the methanol engine on uh, 22nd of March, both Central European time and U USA time, where we have uh, product manager Frederick uh, for the engine and product manager for the methanol fuel unit. 
Alessandro both speaking at that event. So please feel free to register for that if you're interested to learn a little bit more. Finally, uh, on the last part of my presentation, I do apologize, I'm uh, maybe running a wee bit over time, but I'd like to show you um, a two-stroke conversion uh, technology that we're now developing. Um, so this is more geared to, uh, let's say, large merchant vessels. Um, Burtzilla has been uh, working closely with uh, Silkser and WinGD over the years and remains an agent uh, service-wise for WinGD. This is a solution that's been developed purely by Wartzilla two-stroke services. It's not a WinGD solution, but it is applicable on WinGD two-stroke engines. And the challenge we see or owners tell us about is, is the increase in requirements of CII on the existing merchant fleet for large two-stroke engines. How can that be uh, accommodated for? And challenges you might associate with that are the, the value of the investment, uh, the costs of higher time to convert if a conversion is possible, um, additional heat and uh, electrical demand and the lack of space to, to carry this out. So if we were to come up with a solution for a two-stroke engine, it needs to be fuel flexible, uh, not just now, but also in the future, um, optimize retrofit cost, a smooth process to retrofit, use existing energy in the ship and try to keep it as uh, simple as possible. So um, what I can in indicate to you today is that there is a project ongoing and there is R&D work and uh, trials work for uh, a different uh, conversion platform for specifically large marine electronically controlled two-stroke engines to run on future fuels, LNG, methanol and ammonia for now. Those are the three that are targeted. Um, and this features a flexible fuel injection system and a combustion concept that's aimed at minimizing any slip, any fuel slip. So it's a, it's a high pressure uh, injection in that sense. Uh, importantly, the fuel preparation takes place mainly on the engine using the existing energy from the engine. And that simplifies the system. So it's a, a we would say a low complex system, uh, minimized capex and opex. And it's a system whereby the conversion of the engine itself with the appropriate pre-planning could take place in something like three weeks. Um, that's the engine in itself. Of course, other conversion has to take place in the ship uh, for the fuel supply system and, and other modifications. But indeed, it's a modular system uh, where there is actual uh, real potential and possibility to convert from one fuel to another relatively easy in future. So how it works for LNG, um, we supply cryogenic LNG directly to the engine room at low pressure. There's on-engine pressure amplification, which expands the gas and takes it to the engine using the heat from the engine, and that's then injected at medium pressure to the engine. And it does mean that um, in doing it this way and having the cryogenic LNG supplied to the engine room, you can eliminate what you may have needed before in terms of uh, process equipment uh, for existing two-stroke engines using gas. And it also reduces the footprint uh, and, uh, let's see, maximizes the viability of a retrofit. So looking at uh, perhaps a, a conventional setup today, you would have LNG supplied from a cryogenic LNG tank with some bog boil off gas uh, through a fuel preparation room. Um, the gas is expanded, compressed, sent through a gas valve unit towards a two-stroke engine, be it a, an auto cycle low pressure engine or a diesel cycle high pressure engine. And, and that's how the system would, would typically look today. With the system that we now propose for retrofit on, on Silkser engines, we have simplified that. Um, so we have a direct supply of cryogenic LNG to the engine room through a three-layered stainless steel pipe with supply return and vacuum insulation all included in that pipe, which is a standard classified solution available off the shelf. Um, and that is then supplied directly to the engine. So it's a lot more simple uh, layout than perhaps uh, the conventional today. Um, to make use of the bog, it might be possible to install uh, additional gensets uh, burning uh, LNG or boiler systems could be adapted to make use of it. Although there are other means to control bog. Looking at the arrangement on the engine, um, we have the cryo LNG supplied to the amplification unit at 10 bar. The design is pressure at the moment is 16 bar. That's operated by engine servo oil. Um, the cryo LNG is then boosted up to 100 bar at minus 150. It goes through a gas evaporator 
uh, using engine jacket water and has supplied us cold methane gas at minus 50 to a pressure accumulator on the engine, which then is injected directly to the engine at minus 25 degrees C, um, which has been tested successfully now in the lab. And it's uh, proven to be a much more efficient system all around with less uh, parasitic power loss around the whole system. It's a similar system for methanol. So a very similar arrangement for methanol on the engine in that methanol is supplied directly at low pressure. It's amplified on the engine. It's, it's basically injected at medium pressure to the engine. And it has the same sort of benefits for the vessel installation. So looking at that for a methanol conversion, you may need an additional tank uh, apart from the, the modified tank on the ship. Low pressure feed pump, then the low pressure methanol supply, again, through the three layer stainless steel pipe, which includes supply return vacuum and solution to the, to the engine. And um, as long as the fuel supply system is laid out correctly, the actual modifications on the engine to cater for different fuels to go from uh, LNG to methanol to even ammonia potentially in the future, but certainly LNG to methanol, it requires a change in the pressure amplification unit uh, to cater for the volumetric differences, and it requires a change in the, the lower part of the injector. So the methanol is supplied again at 10 bar, it comes out of the amplifier at 100 bar, and it's supplied to the injectors at 100 bar, and that's the layout for methanol on that, that engine type. So in order to, to make something like this become reality, um, an owner would need uh, to tie up with a supplier like ourselves and uh, probably a partner network because the volume of ships in the market that need this type of uh, conversion or could benefit from this type of conversion is quite significant. But you're, you're looking at you know changes to the fuel gas supply system, possibly to the two stroke engines, possibly additional four stroke engines, possibly to the board management and all the other conversion and integration work that needs to be done. Um, just a word on fuel gas supply systems, as mentioned earlier. Um, we, we do have that as a, as a competence internally. It's a growing uh, portfolio. It's expanding all the time. Uh, but it does include you know, a fairly, fairly uh, broad array of uh, subsystems within that system. So a complete turnkey tailor-made system is going to be required and can be provided. The actual scope in the engine, um, to give you an idea what it is per cylinder, it's a cylinder cover with the injectors the accumulator, the gas expander, and the pressure amplifier. And per engine, it's rail enclosure with a ventilated system, which is required for class. Um, the control system, instrumentation, uh, safety system, on-engine piping, and platform conversions, spares, and so on. And again, that engine conversion in itself can take something like uh, 21 days. Uh, the project planning in itself, of course, is a much longer exercise, much more involved and much more detailed. And that's something either ourselves or others would need to partner up with uh, ship owners to really uh, assess the viability um, of fuel conversion before even talking about conversion of the engine. Um, and it may be that, you know, on multi-engine installations that not all engines need to be converted, for example, depending on the installation. Um, or the engines will run on certain fuels a certain amount of the time. Um, that all has to be looked at on a project specific basis, but it's something that needs a high degree of planning and uh, execution. So again, key benefits are the reduced um, GHG emission feeding into the overall decarb effort, the long-term CII compliance and the straightforward retrofitting, which minimizes the off hire plus the ability to change from one fuel to another, potentially even after 10 years of uh, operation on fuel A to fuel B, if the fuel supply system can be designed in that way in, in advance. Um, and there is a, a press release relating to this as well um, on our website, and uh, we have started this work um, together with a partner, um, with MSC, who are going to trial some of this uh, technology during the course of this year. So much more detailed information will come out to the market uh, with technical detail within the next year or so. So um, thank you very much for your attention. Um, that concludes the presentation I wanted to give this evening. So I hope um, that's been of interest for you. Thank you very much for your time and I'm open to questions. Well, brilliant. Awesome. Thanks a million for that, John. Uh, it was, it was well worth the, the time being overrun to, to listen to the, the full breakdown. And uh, and to be fair, like, you know, I think uh, I really like the way you 
I guess you, you brought out the different areas within the um, uh, the engines, how the I guess the the performance of the management systems for the engines is changing over time, and then really what companies like Warsilla are being able to do in order to uh, support the the transition. Of, of marine shipping and how it's going to look in the future because I guess it is one of those things that becomes a, a really big challenge you know because we know we have these different types of fuels uh, but we don't know exactly which way it's going to go or which type of vessel owners are going to go for which t- different types of fuels so I guess having that versatility within the engine design really lends itself to that kind of um, uh, you know understanding what the future fuel is going to be Absolutely and it's, it's as much a challenge for any manufacturer, not just Wartzilla, but all the other engine makers, as it is for the owners and everyone else in the industry, because, um, you know, it isn't clear, you know, the, the extent to which certain fuels will be adopted. Um, and, of course, um, the R&D work I talked about is is, is, a, is an expensive pastime. <laughs> Very expensive, and uh, it has to be done, but it, but it has to be done judiciously. And as you see, the greater one of the greater t- uh, challenges technically is the fact that we have a portfolio of engines that are not all the same age, and don't come from the same technical heritage. So you know that the starting point technically and timeline wise may steer us in a different direction for a different solution for a given engine type than a, than for another engine type for the same fuel. So it's, it's not as if we will have a, always a uniform uh, solution across all the engine types. And of course, this, this is both for new build portfolio, which is the one I showed, but also for the existing engine portfolio out there in the existing fleet. That's equally important, you know, to be able to serve that market and provide the potential for upgrades, at least. Um, no, you know, you know the overall viability has to be assessed by, by the owners in question, of course. And ultimately, it's going to be their choice. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to invite uh, Chris. Uh, so Chris is on our committee as well with the RD Maritime branch. And uh, we've had Slido going on in the in the background. And uh, and not surprisingly, we've got tons of questions. So what we're going to try and do is, is get through as many of them as we can. Um, Chris is pointing out that I think that a lot of them have a similar theme. So what we'll try and do is try to bundle a number of those questions uh, to, together and then hopefully we'll, we'll capture most of them. But for people who are um, uh, listening and watching, a couple of quick things. Yes, the slides should be made available. Just confirm that. That's okay, John? Yeah, yes, and, yes. Um, and uh, basically there will be links by IMRS TV uh, to be able to see the full recording that, uh, that we're live streaming at the moment. So hopefully that answers some of the questions to start off with. But um, I'll give him the first question and then uh, I'll pass over to Chris uh, for, the, for the next question. We'll, we'll get through as many as we can. Okay. Um, okay, so, um, yeah, so I guess one of the first questions that came through, uh, well, actually this is based on, on I guess, uh, sort of popularity in that, so these come up, is um, will bunkering infrastructure lead or lag ship main fuel uh, transformation? So... Chicken and egg question. Yeah, it is a bit. I mean, um, as I say, we, we're probably not in the, the best position to answer that because we are fuel agnostic as such. And, um, you know, uh, the owners have to really know which fuels are available to them and have done quite some detailed investigation into that regionally um, to be able to secure the fuels that they want to invest in. And that might not be immediately. There might be a lag between uh, when the ship comes into operation and when they want to start using that, that particular fuel. Um, I mean, clearly there was a, a certain amount of time, even for the, the adoption of LNG and the growing infrastructure there to the point where we're at today. Even LNG is uh, a kind of minority fuel, even after 20 years. So, I mean, it does take a finite amount of time and there needs to be a demand from an end client uh, to run an operation with a certain fuel. And there needs to be then probably some some uh, growing demand from other clients with similar needs for that to expand. But um yeah, it is, it is a tricky, tricky area. But there are there are obviously big owners out there who've made uh, strong positions uh, on project investments for certain fuel types and are confident of the supply of those fuels and confident that would develop the infrastructure. But perhaps it's those bigger organisations that will have to take the leading position initially. No, that makes sense. All right, Chris, over to you. Okay, thanks, John. Um, so the next question was, um, would you say the current ratio between ship owners who look at long term versus the short term? Um, well, we, we see we see a, a lot of owners uh, 
looking looking at both, to be honest, because uh, if, if you're an owner now looking to invest in a ship for the next 25 or 30 years now, uh, bear in mind what I said, we, we as a supplier certainly don't have all the technically ver verified solutions and answers today. So it's it's quite often the case that, you you know, an owner might look short term at an intermediate step to, to that, that provides a flexible platform for upgrade in the future. So I think they are thinking typically long term, but it probably does vary from market to market, from country to country. I mean, there are obviously in certain countries there are certain incentives available for the development of green projects, et cetera, which tends to accelerate activity in those, those countries. Whereas in other, in other countries, it's purely down to the uh, investment decisions of, of the owners. Um, and how the market operates and how they see the public perception and, and so on. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, th I would say, I mean, from my small exposure to the owners I deal with, which is by no means <laughs> a representative of all the owners uh, probably listening to the call, but, yeah, I would think everyone's uh, really investigating this whole area p fairly deeply, if, you know, who, who has a, a new ship project, either now or in the next two or three years. I mean, it, it may well be that... Um, as I say, because we're looking at beyond 2030 before zero carbon fuels probably really kick in and are available, that it's a series of intermediate steps which get the owners towards their own policies and targets that they might have stated in their own annual reports around around decarb. Um, so no, the, I think the interest is, is definitely there. I suppose you touched on during your presentation as well about uh, sort of the, the Poseidon principles. And, uh, and I guess, you know, so to, to expand on that, the Poseidon principles are, are, are I guess, um, principles that a certain number of financial institutions have signed up to, uh, specifically for the financing of shipping um, industry and, and, and ship owners. And, uh, and, and those principles involve sort of um, a, a demonstrable um, way to, to, uh, to, I guess, to evidence how they're managing decarbonisation and emissions reductions within the, the vessels. So uh, is, that, is that rough? You know, sort of yeah, what? yeah, and of course it adds, it adds another layer of stakeholder engagement to the whole discussion of the investment into ships and fleets because if, if part of the outcome may, may have an influence on, on the lending capability of an organisation towards a given owner, then clearly that's a significant input. Um, so, so, you know, there are other uh, similar organisations or, or clusters uh, that are thinking along the same lines in terms of finance. Green finance should relate to green solutions in yeah. shipping. And they try to obviously encourage that. And that goes all the way down the, the potential supply chain, uh, you know, to suppliers like ourselves. No, that's very good. And uh, right, so I'm trying to dig through the questions here like you know I'll, I'll, there's a nice real doozy of one here but i'll leave that to last <laughs> uh, but um i guess i'll look at uh, there's one from uh uh georgia's here uh while we work towards the long term can uh what can small and mid-sized shipping companies do in the meantime to decarbonize so i guess yeah so looking at the long term uh, for, for smaller shipping companies, you know, what, what do you see the yeah, options there for them? But it kind of depends also on the technology that's in the ship. And um, I mean, there are, you know, in leading up to EEXI, EDI, and then into CII, it's been, you know, there have been small interventions that we've talked about a lot of the time from a, from a supplier's perspective. So, for example, from the Watsilla point of view, it's around things like power limitations, systems on shaft lines, which are part of that offering. It's around propulsion efficiency devices and other devices that might incrementally help to achieve the target. But if you, if you think of things like engine conversion, then, of course, you need to be starting with a certain technology platform to even make conversion viable or you have to replace that product so it can become quite challenging and costly to make a significant step but it's all vessel specific equipment specific you know there's it's very hard to, to give a generic rule but there's a number of incremental things that can be done and then there's a number of more major interventions that you could consider that are you know obviously a bit more all-encompassing I suppose it is a good point because, like you know, you you you've talked a lot about the en en engine or uh, energy efficiencies. So you know, so the larger uh, sort of uh, shaft generators that are deployed for for you know sort of prop vessels, and uh, and then you know, I guess, do you see more of an integration of um, of, of a wider energy system? Like you know, we've seen like like the likes of rotor sails uh, been talked about for vessels. So do you see a lot of, of what you're doing? 
as being a part of the solution, but that's all all being driven by other energy efficiency devices. Um, um, no, I mean we, we're we're absolutely we're engaged with those. Uh, I mean we don't we don't manufacture all of those things. So with Animoy we have uh, some relationship, and it's the same with Silverstream. We have a, a kind of marketing and project relationship there. Um, so it, it's more partnering up with potential suppliers of devices that have been proven to work for certain installations and expanding the range and the portfolio of devices that could be deployed because they're not all suitable for every ship type you know, in every operation. Clearly, there are drawbacks and pros and cons to all of them. Some of them are our own in-house uh, modifications where we, we can hydrodynamically assess those ourselves. Some of them are external partnerships where we can also give some, some input hydrodynamically to that as well. Um, but I, I see that expanding, you know, as more and more of those devices coming in, come into being has been and proven to be useful. Then, of course, we're moving away from being a supplier of everything that's in the system to being an integrator of what's in the system with, you know, let's say a core element of supply from our own scope. But uh, the energy management, the power management is at the heart of it. And, and even that being at the heart of it isn't enough if you haven't gone back to the data driven design process, you know, at some point and really optimized according to the operating profile and load profile, how all those discrete elements should be sized and optimized and then how it should work as a whole. So, so it's, they're all really quite interdependent. I, I, think it's, I think it's one of the things that's probably from my viewpoint, thing that's been acknowledged most in the last couple of years, the fact that if, if you go to look for a like-for-like -like replacement to replace heavy fuel oil, marine diesel oil, with either biofuel or even a hydrogen or ammonia or whatever else, that because you're not going to get necessarily the same sort of uh, energetic value, that you have to look at other energy efficiencies to, in order to, to operate your system, which helps you know, bridge the gap between sort of, uh, the energy requirements uh, with, with, with an alternative fuel. And yeah. I think that's, that's that's becoming more obvious now. Is that would you think that's the case? yeah? And I think another thing is uh, even with the data de design process, etc. Number of times you'll design a system, optimize it, you know, in your production process and at the shipyard and at sea trial and so on, deliver it, and then find that the operator is not operating it the way. <laughs> perhaps that it should be optimally optimized. And there's a certain amount of fine tuning to those systems that has to be done en route where the vessel operates. It can't all be done during the sea trials at a shipyard that needs to be fine tuned, you know, an energy management system. So I, th I think there's probably very many cases where all the elements are, are probably there, but it needs some fine tuning to really, to really get the, the, the true benefit from it. So yeah, an element of training and uh, and, and competency included that. Well. Yeah, well, pot potentially, you know, in some some operations, there are some masters perhaps that prefer to have certain equipment on when they're going through certain manoeuvres or whatever, and that may or may not be required according to an energy efficiency and em emissions reduction view of things. Yeah, you know, so it's, it's there's, there's an element of that for for certain. Yeah. Okay, uh, Chris, what other questions are you seeing on there? Mm. Um, there were a handful of questions to do with um, supply of fuels and how this connects up both globally and to do with linking to other industries, for example, aviation. Is there any any trends or anything we can do to... Um. Yeah, it's a, good, it's a good question because, I mean, we've, we've raised the same question ourselves, you know, as I say, we're not trying to second guess how the market's developed because clearly the marine market is not always the, the primary market for a lot of these these potential fuels. Um, and that's that's partially why we don't really think there'll be much happening in the way of, you know, zero carbon fuels from maritime in, in great volumes before, you know, let's say post 2030 onwards. Um but no, it's, it's it's a good question, especially if you know um, road haulage or aviation start to start to accelerate in a certain direction and need a certain fuel type. You know, perhaps marine will not therefore be first place in the queue in that in that sort of sector. So yeah, it's a good question. But I, I, again, that's why we are really concentrating on developing engine technologies that are able to burn a range of these fuels. So there will be choices for you know, marine operators to, to take that still make it viable. I imagine that helps with the global distribution as well. You can sail from port to port and have confidence you'll be able to refuel. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think you're right. That's a, that's a good point, Chris. Because like, what you want to make sure is, uh, I guess, from the vessel operators, the fact that where they're going is going to be something that uh, allows them to be able to, to keep fuel stock. 
stop there. And uh, so another question from George is, is um, are the ship owners keen to use alternative fuels such as ammonia or hydrogen? So I guess... Yeah, keen to investigate it, you know, because it's it's um, it's a complex uh, specification, if you like, to develop, and it's made all the more complex by the fact that suppliers like ourselves don't don't have all the you know oven ready engine technology available today, for example, and even when looking at a fuel supply system for ammonia, we have done rather a lot of work on that, but it's not hundred percent completely defined or finalised yet in terms of a you know, what would be a fully class approved safe system according to the regs that are under development. Uh, it's, it's a good part of the way there, but, you know, um, and I'm sure we'll get there in the not too distant future. Uh, but still, we, we haven't got uh, all the answers in terms of every engine type that we know will be released with a certain fuel type at a certain time. That's yet to be fully defined and it is one of the challenges uh, for everyone. Um, Clearly, it's, it's quite difficult to make a, a decision to jump in a certain direction for a fuel like ammonia if it's not uh, completely risk assessed uh, no. as a project at a project level, you know, not, not just in terms of the fuel supply, but in terms of the whole ship design meeting class requirements in terms of the engine technology being verified and available within a certain timeline and so on. Uh, but you know, there are there are projects where we actively do discuss, you know, ammonia as, as a fuel. So it's it does happen and it is happening. No, absolutely. Right. So I, I, I'm conscious of uh, the time and, uh, and, and you know, eating into people's evenings. And, and it's, the, the time's just flown by. But uh, Chris, what I'm going to do is leave the last question to yourself. So you, you get the last choice. And then, uh, and then I think we'll close up. What we'll try and do, though, is we'll take uh, all the questions that are on Slido. And, uh, and you know, so uh, we'll see if we can get as many of them answered if we haven't covered them tonight. So at least uh, the participants will be able to get some sort of uh, details back. And um, yeah, so Chris, over to you for the last question. Thank you. Um, so yeah, the final question I'd, I'd like to ask, what are Wartsila doing to convince ship owners to transition to the, the, the alternative fuels? Yeah, I, I, again, uh, I think what we are doing is showing uh, that we're investing a lot of money in the development of fuel systems and engines you know, and we, we clearly believe that there's an imperative to go in that direction. I mean, our own, our own kind of uh, philosophy and purpose is enabling uh, sustainable societies through, you know, technology and innovation. So that's what we're trying to do. Um, but we're not trying to push ship owners in any particular direction. I mean, it's, we're, we're further down, if you like, the decision making chain than that. We're a key supplier. Technology-wise, we're a key innovator and we need to actually co-create some of these solutions with customers, especially if in some instances, for example, there might be some pilot testing involved uh, for a given engine type, for a given fuel type. That's something we cannot, you know, always do on our own. So we believe that, that you know, this is a direction we have to, have to all go in. Um, but at the same time, we're, we're, taking a, we're, we're taking serious discussions and a bit of a lead from the owners that we talk to. Uh, because ultimately they will have to decide which fuel direction they're going to take. And as long as we have a, a kind of a proven, verified portfolio of solutions within a given time period and, and a, sort of a confirmation, we've got a flexible base that they can work from and build from in future to deal with some of the uncertainties. Um, I think that that should uh, help, you know, progress that whole discussion. Brilliant. No, listen, John, and for anybody who is looking to get in contact with you or, or, or discuss with you, what's, what's, the, what's the best way to, to contact you? Yeah, uh, my, my email address is john.grant at wartzilla.com. So anyone's more than welcome to drop me an email uh, or contact me through LinkedIn. Uh, I'm, I'm up there as well. Um, and I'll be happy to try and assist. Excellent. No, that's brilliant. And listen, thanks very much. What we really wanted to do is uh, start off, you know, sort of, uh, I guess, this year's events with uh, with a bang, and, and that's exactly what we did. Uh, it's it's about tackling some of the the really challenging issues and, and looking at the the innovations that are there within the maritime industry to kind of drive these decarbonisation uh, challenges that we have. So, listen, John, I want to thank you for your time and uh, and for the great presentation. It was great to have you um, presenting. And, um, and for everybody else uh, online, I want to thank you for taking your time out of your evening in order to come present, uh, to, to participate in this event. Um, uh, like I say, I, we won't have got through all the questions. We will try and get back to as many as we can, but you can contact us through the, uh, the LinkedIn page for the Aberdeen Maritime branch. 
and uh, and likewise uh, contact uh, committee members through that forum as well. Um, next month we'll be having our next presentation. The final details to be to be ironed out, and uh, we look forward to having the the, uh, the participants again come along for our next technical presentation. And uh, I want to thank uh, Chris as well uh, from Motion to, to uh, for his assistance as well. And uh, and one final again, thank you to yourself, John. So thanks very much. Thank thank you, and to everyone who's who's listened in, very much appreciated. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, was that the recording now? But again, the recordings will be available afterwards. So, bye for now.